Hello, I'm Stephen Groom. Welcome to Let God Speak. This quarter looks at present truth in the book of Deuteronomy. And today we'll focus upon Moses and the foundation and beginning of the fifth book of the Pentateuch, which is Deuteronomy. Our lesson today is entitled Moses History Lesson. We will use a thematic approach to our study today, which means that we will use other Old and New Testament books of the Bible to establish important biblical principles that will help us travel safely through our life's journey. Please join us for this important study. On our panel today, we have Adrian Craig and Nathan Tasker. Welcome, gentlemen. Okay. Let us begin our study with prayer, shall we? Let's bow our head. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to understand these important lessons from the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy through this panel discussion. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we'll begin this um, study on Moses' history lesson by focusing on the person of Moses, who is the author and the, ca the main character in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, so, Adrian, how important was Moses in relation to the contribution he made to the Old Testament books of the well, Bible? Well, uh, Stephen, there are 700 references to Moses in the Old Testament, and he's probably the greatest human character in the Old Testament. And... Um, when we look at how much he wrote, 25% of the Old Testament was written by Moses. So that indicates he's fairly significant. And the book that we're looking at today is one of the f first five books of the Bible written by Moses. And of course, it covers some very significant themes like uh, creation, yes. uh, the fall, entrance of sin, redemption, story of Abraham, selection of the Israelites. So they're very important. And these are very important themes for the establishing the foundation of the Christian uh, doctrine, isn't it? True. Continuing uh, with the background of Deuteronomy, um, Exodus 32 records the terrible sin of how Israel made and worshipped the golden calf um, at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Um, how does Moses respond and, and what does this tell us about the character of Moses, Nathan? Yeah, so in addition to being a great contributor or a great author, I, I like the way that we get to see the, the personality of Moses as well. And in this particular reference here, Exodus 32 verse 32, Moses is essentially pleading uh, to God on behalf of his own um, wayward people. He says this, but now... To speaking to God, but now if you will forgive their sin very well, but if not, please wipe me out from your book, which you have written. So Moses is actually saying, give this responsibility, the, the word here, Nassar in Hebrew, let me bear the burden, let me carry it like the rocket going to the moon, let me carry the payload, Lord, if if it's required that that they have to pay for it, because we can't have them miss out. I'll miss out, but don't let them miss out. Yes. So he was willing to lose his own soul for his people. That's an amazing example of love and sacrifice on behalf of his people. In doing this, who was Moses uh, amplifying, um, Adrian? Uh, he's typifying the work of Jesus that we read about in the, in the, well, in, in the entire scripture, but particularly Hebrews where it says, he is able to save us to the uttermost, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So Moses is representing what Jesus is doing for the entire human race. Mm. And um, maybe we could quote Peter, who said, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. And, and that's probably why... Moses was entrusted by the Lord and had such a close resemblance, uh, sorry, relationship with the Lord because he, he showed so much of the characteristics of Jesus, didn't he? Mm. So what can you tell us, Nathan, anything else about the, uh, the life of Moses that gives us glimpses of Jesus? 
I guess for those listeners here in Australia or New Zealand in particular, the Anzac tradition of mateship is is a massive tradition that we're very proud of here. And it seems Moses, in representing or reflecting as a, as a type of Christ, seems to put his mates, his friends, ahead of himself, willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice so that those he cares about can have a better go. That, that to me, is a pretty, pretty amazing thing to see. Selfless, isn't it? Yes. Everyone admires those sorts of characters, yeah, don't they? Yeah, yes. very much. So, Adrian... Um, the word Deuteronomy means second giving of the law, Deuteros and, and Nomos for Nomi. Um, what is, can you give us an overview of what Deuteronomy is all about? Uh, three basic themes in the book of Deuteronomy, and they arise out of three sermons. So actually this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel before he dies, and so he's giving them counsel. The three themes that come to, to, to the fore uh, he's saying, don't forget your past. Recite history. Mm. If you reflect on history, that'll give you confidence as you face the future. Yes. Number two, as you've mentioned, uh, Steve, uh, Deuteronomy means the second law. So it's, there's emphasis, a lot of emphasis on the law. But we ought to say in saying that, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that there's very much uh, space given to the love and the tender care of the Father. And, and that's God's covenant, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then finally... Um, uh, Moses says, don't allow the world to squeeze you into its mould. So there are the three themes that come from the book of Deuteronomy. And the Thank book you. of Deuteronomy see, receives a good focus in the New Testament as well. We ought to mention this. The three times that Jesus is confronted by the devil, he responds on the three occasions by quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. Yes, very important book. Thank you for that. In the opening chapter of Deuteronomy, um, chapter 1, verse 3, um, the 40th year is mentioned. Why is this so important and relevant, Nathan? Yes, uh, it seems like uh, there's a bit of a prediction or a prophecy or a promise here from God that has a time element to it. And uh, in Numbers 14, verse 34, it seems like there is a specific time where Israel has popped into quarantine, not for COVID, but because they hadn't trusted the Lord and needed to learn some lessons. It says here in Numbers uh, 14.34, in accordance with the number of days that you spied out the land, 40 days for every day you shall suffer the punishment of your guilt a year. That is 40 years um, so that they would understand how they had, had wronged God. So 40 years later, that time had come to a close. Now Israel's out on parole, and that's the time when this is picked up. Now's the time to go and get that promise. And that day for a year, uh, it, it's a... It it comes into the Bible a lot, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, so there are some people today that would question whether or not the day for a year principle works. But clearly here, God intended to keep it. And if we look at the Messiah yes. uh, later on, there's clearly a day for a year that works for Jesus to be the Messiah as well. So it's an important principle to look at, I think. Yes. And so um, Israel's entering into the promised land was delayed for 40 years. Did these readjustments take God by surprise, Adrian? No, not at all. God's omniscient and he knows everything. He's never taken by surprise and he has a plan for every choice that Israel or any, any choice that we make. God is there to make sure that his plan is carried out. Yes. This is a big idea in the Bible that, that God knows everything in advance. It's called his omniscience, isn't it? Mm. Um, where in the Bible can we see this in other places, Nathan? I was always going to wonder to myself, is there any place in the Bible where it doesn't? <laughs> so a <laughs> lot of the Bible does so, yeah, I mean, the, Obviously, yeah. Daniel uh, is a big uh, book, chapter 2, um, the prediction about the future kingdoms, yes. 7, 8, 9, talking about the coming Messiah that the Israelites are looking for. So um, many of those. The book the of Isaiah, the book of Ezekiel, there's 70 times when God says, I'm going to predict stuff and then you will know. And more than almost half the time, it's talking to non Jewish, non-Israelite, um, non-believers. So there's plenty throughout the Bible saying, hey, check me out, God says, and I'll, I'll prove to you that I mean business and that I'll follow through. And, and one of the ways he, he proves that he is God, he says, is in Isaiah 45, he says, prove me that I, you know, I know the end from the beginning, doesn't he? Yes. So nothing catches God by surprise. Coming back to the uh, book of Deuteronomy, what important role does Numbers 
13 and 14 have to the background of the book of Deuteronomy. And, and let's begin with Deuteronomy chapter 13, Adrian. What happened there that's relevant to this well, background? Well, the children of Israel uh, have come up with the promised land now and they've sent the uh, spies in. And um, spies bring back a report that's a mixed report. Two will give a very positive report and ten give a very negative report. That negative report is sort of stopping them. They say, no, no, we can't go in. Yeah, there's, there's giants in the land. Yes. As a matter of fact, it's a contradictory report on the part of the people who are giving a negative one because they say it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Yep. But they also say that it's a land that consumes the inhabitants and there are giants there. It's so paradoxical, we can, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're, they're contradicting. As a matter of fact, someone said that if the ten had given the negative report, I'm going to have to get this right, and the two had given, given the positive report. So either no, way, no matter which side it was, yeah, either, either yeah, way they wanted to right. go for the negative yeah. report. Yeah, yeah. So the people, basically their problem was they didn't believe the Lord. The Lord had mm. already told them they were going in. But they looked at circumstances around them, didn't it? Didn't well, they, well uh, Steve, the interesting thing is they had the cloud overhead and the pillar of fire. Yes. And God was directing them, as Moses says in this chapter, verses 31 to 33, says God goes ahead and he searches out where you're to go. So they're saying we're foregoing that. We want yes. to do our own research. Yes. Yeah. And, and their research brings them at loggerheads with what God has already said. And that's the problem right there. Yeah. We can um, derive many important lessons from this story, but what is the lesson found in Numbers 14, 11 to 20 that's also found in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 20 to 46 in regards to the people's rebellion at Kadesh Barnea? Um, yeah, this is a bit sad to have to contemplate this really, but it, it, I think we can all see here that these people were really looking to to chart their own course and do their own thing in opposition to God's desire for them. And this rebelliousness or this lack of trust, um, we can point fingers at them and say, boy, those people were a bit um, naughty. But I look at my own life and wonder, do I trust God any more than these people? You know, when all the COVID stuff's going on or stuff's going wrong in my life, do I really trust God more than these people? And uh, perhaps that's a, an important uh, thing to think about. We too, like Israel, need to put our faith in God and not our own course. Don't trust the requests that humans make. Trust the promises that God has given us. But the important, the p important point is that, that God brought to Moses that he said he was going to wipe these people out. Remember, Moses said, no, no, if you wipe these people out, your name shall be slurred amongst the, amongst the um, Gentiles. Egyptians. And, right. Yeah, so, so Moses was thinking about, the, um, about God's character, about God's name, wasn't he? And, and th in this way, yeah, Moses was concerned with God's glory, wasn't he? Very clear. So, Very so, that, so we can basically summarize that Israelites lacked faith in God's word, just as we may in so many ways. But what happens when we do have faith and trust in the word of the God and live according to his will, Adrian? Well, obviously, everything that God did wasn't just for Israel uh, alone. It was also for the world. So he wanted to represent, he wanted a, a witness to go to all nations. So the Israelites were in a position to bring glory to God to all peoples. Just as today we have, as Christians, as a Christian church, mm. uh, we've given the responsibility of bringing glory to God. As it's spelled out in Revelation chapter 14, was it, was it verse 7? Fear God and give glory to him. And so this is, this, is the, uh, this is the charter for the church, wherever we may be. Yes. And don't look at the, the bad circumstances that may seem to be obstacles. But if you, you count and you just have faith in God's word, no matter what, you know, he will bring it to pass. Is so that we, right? we need to note that uh, the, the, uh, the lack of faith on the part of the Israelites hindered the work. Put it 40 years behind. Yes. And 40 years is a pretty good developing time for making some new giants. Yes. So they had opportunity to manufacture some more giants. They had opportunity to, to improve their weaponry. 
and, and sort out the strategy. This is the opposition. So that when God brought them back, for the Israelites, 40 years later, he brought them back to the same spot where yes. they'd been 40 years before. And in actual fact, he said to them, look what happens when you trust me. Jericho was conquered with a trumpet blow and a shout. Yes. That's a funny way to fight. But God is saying, I could have done this earlier if you'd believed. Mm. So you mentioned that, um, well, Israel was meant to be a light, weren't they, as they went into Canaan. They were to be a reflection of God, a light, a witness to the other nations, that is the Gentiles, in order to save them. That means that they were meant to be evangelists, so to speak. Are we supposed to do the same, Nathan? Yeah, I think uh, Adrian's alluded to that in the mm. book of Revelation. And I, I guess there's also a passage or many passages like yes. this in the, the New Testament, the Gospels. Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 16 says, uh, Let your light so shine before men or before the people so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And there's, there's themes like this indicating that all of us, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, uh, whether we are in a particular place or time or another one, we all have this opportunity to experience and reflect God personally. So, so this light that you mentioned, is it uh, characteristics of God in our lives? Is this what it means by light? Because we don't glow more than other people. So it's not a literal <laughs> light, is it? Yeah, I guess it's more like a mirror reflecting. I, I, it's good. I haven't thought about it that way, but it seems like if we were to reflect what God has done in our life, people will be attracted to the light and uh, be encouraged, I would, I would suspect. Steve, maybe it was the witness of the Jews that won Caleb because Caleb wasn't a Jew. Very he was, a, he was an Edomite yeah. yes. and he hadn't been brought up a Jew. So he, and he's the one who stands out as a believer and a, one, a true man of faith. Where did he get it from? Yes. So you could say that as these heathen giants were growing over that 40 years, God too was raising up some giants of faith from unlikely places. <laughs> okay. On this very issue, I'd like to read from the New Testament, the book of Ephesians, chapter 3 and verse 10, from the writings of Paul. And he says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Um, how is this text related to our theme, Adrian? Well, that it goes the manifold um, wisdom of God might be reflected. Well, the witness of God's people goes beyond the earth. It goes out into the cosmos because Paul says we're, we're like on stage, we're a theatre a spectacle to men and to angels. And so the plan of redemption has a, a broader aspect. And Jesus, I think, indicated this in John 12. He said, um, how, did he, how did he put it? Um, we could probably look it up if you want to. Yeah. Um, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Yes. And there's a verse that says, um, how does it go now? Um, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast out. Jesus is indicating that the, uh, the plan of redemption has a, has a broader aspect than just the redemption of man. And, and we're just actors on a stage. So we're either taking one side or the other. We're either taking God's side by following the word or we're taking the enemy's side by listening to his doubts. Is I will right? draw all men. In actual fact, it's... Uh, Men is supplied. It's all creation. Yeah. Yeah. So that, to me, that shows me how important this life is. Mm. And uh, that following on this theme, um, what role, if any, do we have as individuals in this theatre? I've already alluded to some. Yeah. yeah. It almost seems like we're witnesses in a dock, I would suspect. I kind of imagine us as like emissaries or diplomats on stage, as uh, Adrian has just mentioned, and as we give our personal perspective, our, our witness, our experience, uh, Joshua himself says here, Joshua 24, verse 14 and 15, he's sort of saying, I've been in the witness dock and you guys choose what you want to do, but as for me and my house, we're going to follow the true God, not the gods of those other people. We're going to follow him. And he invites those around him to follow in his example. Yes, thank you for that. In fact, Paul says that we're ambassadors, ambassadors mm. of representatives from the king from their yes. original country, aren't yep, they? Yep. Just like that. Coming back to the um, story of Israel having to wander 
in the wilderness for 40 years, during this time, the new generation of the Israelites had to prepare their hearts to come close to God before they would eventually go into the promised land. This all sounds like doom and gloom, you know, having to wander around in the wilderness for all this time. But is there any positive points that we can gain from this um, for them, Adrian? Yeah, let's, let's read, uh, if I may, Steve, uh, chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, verses uh, 10 and 11. And uh, this is what's happening during the 40 years. They're wandering in the wilderness. And the Lord your God has increased your numbers so that today you're as many as the stars of the sky. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he's promised. Mm. Yes. So during the 40 years of wandering, the manna continued, the water flowed. God was, God was the, indeed the shepherd for these people. And, and it says that there's not, there was not one sick person amongst them. So, you know, they were eating angels' food, Paul says, you know, the manna. Yeah. So they were well looked after, weren't they? Yeah, and I think we get a quote from Nehemiah where it says, they lacked nothing, their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Yes. So God cared for them. Maybe we need to go into the wilderness to get this good health as well. <laughs> Maybe. If God would look after us like he looked after well, them. Well, he does. He does. We woke up this morning. We woke up. We have another day to glorify God. Yeah. As a direct result of God's blessing upon the people, what happened and what steps did Moses take to deal with the situation, Nathan? Oh, yeah, there's a lot there. But I guess just simply we could say the, the, um, the nation of Israel grew to the point where it needed some more structure or, uh, um, I guess, organization. The Hebrew word kahal, as, as you probably know, points to a, a, a formal structure. So yes. it seems like Moses would have had to work uh, with his team to get something a bit more official happening. He finally realized it was too much work to lead the people on his own. Um, does the church today, like Israel back then, also need organization, Adrian? It certainly does. Order, system, programming, all of nature demonstrates to us that uh, nothing operates by chance. And um, God... Well, what happened this morning? Did the sun get up late? Never. The sun's always on time to go down or to come up. Yes. So the system is order. And uh, Paul highlighted the importance of system and structure and using our various gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Yes. And he used the figure of the body. The hand's important. The leg's important. But the leg can't do what the hand does. I don't put my foot into my pocket to get my wallet out. That's for my hand. Yes. So, so you're saying that each person, like each part of the body, has a different role to play or different gift? Is that yeah, right? Yes, that's what, we're saying. that's what we're saying on the base of Scripture. Yes. Just as Moses had the, the, the leader of the hundred and fifties and tens, so the various uh, responsibilities, the various uh, job assignments for the church. Yes. members of the church. And we have that. We have organization in the church, don't we? Yeah. Pastor. Yeah. Continuing with Deuteronomy chapter two and three comes to a very uh, controversial issue. Um, it, it involves Israel finally entering Canaan after the 40 years, and they began to war against people of Canaan. Can you tell us, expand on what controversies come out of, of this commandment and, and what Israel had to do with certain people such as the Amorites, Nathan. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, it's interesting how this comes up in modern conversation. It's, it's certainly not a new question that has come up. But if we have a look at somewhere like uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 6, for example, and I'm reading just one verse without the background or the uh, postscript, but it says this, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 6, we utterly destroyed them as we did to... Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, the women and children of every city. And uh, I guess from Baruch Spinoza forward, even before him, lots of people are wondering, how is this a good thing? Where is your good God uh, when we have... Because God is supposed to be a God of love, isn't he? And, and so how do we justify or explain to others how a loving God wanted his people to kill the children with the adults of the corrupt nations. Adrian, and also you can answer after that. 
um, Nathan. Yeah, well, this leads us to a, I don't know what, a $64,000 question. It's issue. a big issue, isn't it? Yeah, the issue of uh, God involved in correcting the wicked or bringing punishment on the wicked, the destroying that takes place is a very, very difficult question. And I think what we have to say is let's look at the way God deals with the righteous or those who are counted righteous and see his graciousness and his goodness and don't allow that to be factored out when you're looking at the issue of evil because we are in a moral universe. We are accountable. Yes. And the Bible very clearly demonstrates that in the way God deals with, shall we say, the righteous and the unrighteous. Mm. Um, there's lots of examples of God's grace and God's mercy. I think of the story of Nebuchadnezzar. For 40 years he pursued him. Is that a God who's uh, hot on people's uh, heels trying to bring about mm -hmm. destruction? He's patient with him. Yes. 120 years of, the, uh, of um, preamble to the flood. God gave uh, them opportunity. Sodom and Gomorrah even sent angels down to warn them and to alert them that destruction was going to come if indeed they were not obedient. So, um, I don't know, Nathan... I was going to just uh, step in with that Sodom and Gomorrah. Some people say how terrible it would be that God would destroy a city like that. But God actually said he'd save all of those five cities if there were ten righteous. The righteous people that were saved in the end was Lot. I'm not sure how righteous he was, offering his daughters to some strangers. Um, Lot's wife, well, we know what happens to her. We have the two daughters... And we're just talking about the Amorites here in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 6. The children, the Amorites, were descendants of Lot and his daughter. <laughs> so these were the most righteous people that God could find, whom he saved yes. from Sodom, keeping in mind that four uh, chapters earlier, God had rescued Sodom from those roving kings. So God saves Lot uh, uh, twice. Yes. And it's in mercy to the other nations that he destroys them because they just become a stumbling block to the nations mm. around them. Thank you for your help today, uh, gentlemen. That's all we have time for. God sought to show Israel that by a close relationship with him, they could safely travel through the wilderness to the promised land. In the same way, we are going through the wilderness of life on this earth and God is seeking to show us how we can live a life of ever-growing faith in him. And just like Moses reflected the Messiah to come, we can also reflect Jesus' character to those around us who don't know him. We are glad you are with us today on Let God Speak. All our past programs can be viewed on our website, 3abnaustralia.org.au. Look for our teacher's notes if you need them. You can also email us on lgs at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We hope you join us again. God bless. You have been listening to Let God Speak, a production of 3ABN Australia Television. To catch up on past programs, please visit 3abnaustralia.org.au. Call us in Australia on 02 4973 3456 or email radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We'd love to hear from you.